This live presentation was produced in Ashland, Oregon by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. RVML relies on the support of our volunteers, members, and donors to organize and present these programs. For more information about this presentation or to borrow, download, or purchase other recordings from our catalog, please visit our website at rvml.org. So, as I said, um, we have to kind of be skeptical, to, uh, aware at least, that these overworld characters that we see on the media and on the newspaper covers, you know, it's just like the old John Dees and Cornelius Agrippa, when you open the old books on magic and you see these old woodcuts and, you know, glorious faces of these magicians and underneath it it goes such and such father of astronomy, blah, blah, blah. These characters were all under patronage, all under royal patronage. It might look lovely and, and antique and exotic now, but these people didn't serve the ordinary human race at all. They were under public patronage. And in those days, if you did not want to serve you know, these masters, or you had been working with them and then you sort of you know, realized what was up, your fate was usually the pauper's grave. As Vivaldi, Mozart, and you know, the list goes on, found out, or it'll be prison like Wilhelm Reich and Raymond Royal Reif and so many others I've also discovered. So the overworld figures are merely the front piece. They are not the architects of the philosophies that they implement. As Benjamin Disraeli, who was the first Jewish prime minister of England, who spent his life trying to expose these secret societies, he says, the world is run by very different personages from what is imagined by those who are not behind the scenes. Over here, your Supreme Court Justice at the time of the Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson era, I think, was Felix Frankfurter. He said, the real rulers in Washington are invisible and exercise power from behind the scenes. Now, you say that as a conspiracy author, and they go, you're crazy, lock them up. These are from the horse's mouth. The most intelligent and illustrious people in your country are saying it. Blavatsky says something fascinating in her works on the subject. There exists another class of adepts belonging to a brotherhood also mightier than any other, they have had to be ranked with the adepts of the black art. These are our Roman Catholic fathers and clergy, a hundred times more learned in secret symbology and the old religion than our Orientalists will ever be. There are more profoundly learned Kabbalists in Rome and throughout Europe and America than is generally suspected. Thus are the brotherhoods of the black adepts more powerful and dangerous than any host of Eastern occultists. Now, one caveat. When she says Roman Catholic father, she's not talking about the ordinary Roman Catholic person who follows that religion. Just like earlier on when I was talking about Freemasons, I'm not talking about the average commoner garden person, your neighbor, you know, who goes and joins the local Freemasonic Lodge. They're probably well-meaning, decent philanthropic, philanthropic people who, you know, I know many Masons. I know very senior Masons. They're all decent people. I am talking about bloodline Freemasons from the old dynastic families, you know, who haven't, like you and I, joined from zero degrees and then try to climb up the old way. In Scottish Rite Freemasonry, they have two sections. They have York Rite and Scottish Rite. Scottish Rite is sort of open to the public, and they make you think it's just this thing, you know, where it's like an initiation grad gradational thing. But the York Rite Freemasons, the, the top of the Freemasonic order, are bloodline Freemasons whose families and dynasties have been the creators of the Freemasons and down the line. That's what I'm talking about, bloodline types. So when she's talking about Roman Catholic fathers, she's talking about the Vatican. Now, Vatican is not the same thing as Roman Catholicism. That's what you need to realize. When you say Vatican to somebody and Catholics get up in arms, Vatican is a political institution. Vatican, uh, Catholicism is a religion. And they fuse these things together so you don't know that. But the Vatican is a secret society. The Vatican is controlled by the Swiss Guard, protected by a Swiss Guard. Well, didn't I say that the headquarters of Freemasonry is in Switzerland? So are all the neutral banks, right? So is the Court of Human Rights. You see, what is neutrality in a country? <laughs> so that you and I can't check on who's putting their money there and what goes on. The Vatican is a different entity. And it comes from the Latin word Vaticanus, which means the place of the sorcerers, OK? She goes on to say, while the real brothers, that's Masons, died ignominious deaths, 
the spurious order that took over, which tried to step into their shoes, became exclusively a branch of the Jesuits. That's the Illuminati, because Adam Weishaupt was a Jesuit. Jesuits being a, created by the Vatican. Under the immediate tutelage of the latter, true-hearted Masons ought to reject with horror any connection, let alone descent from these. There are numbers of the mystic brotherhoods which have nothing to do with civilized countries, and it is in their unknown communities that are concealed the skeletons of the past. These adepts, she says, could, if they choose, lay claim to strange ancestry. I think after, you know, today you'll know what she means by strange ancestry. Giuseppe Manzini, head of the Verian Illuminati, says himself, something went wrong with that slide. Anyway, we form an association of brothers in all points of the globe. Yet there is one unseen that can hardly be felt, yet it weighs on us. Whence comes it? Where is it? No one knows, or at least no one tells. This association is secret even to us, the veterans of the secret societies. Okay? This is the leader of the Illuminati saying, we're controlled by somebody that we don't even know who it is. That's what pyramids are all about, isn't it? Pyramidical structure. The Duke of Brunswick, that's the Grand Master of World Freemasonry, stood up in France because he knew that his order had been infiltrated. You see, what happened was that um, in uh, 1700s, the Illuminati, Bavarian Illuminati, Weishaupt had sent a writer to France, from Germany to France. He was writing, and you know they take the mail, right, in the pack? <laughs> Weird fate, things happen in fate. The guy got struck with lightning when he was in France. <laughs> And the Belgian and French you know, locals, police come out and pick up their remains. Well, what the hell is this? And they open the guy's satchel and they find all the secret codes, you know, and secret letters of this new secret society that's just appeared. And it's all against the king, you know, it's against democracy. They're going, what the hell is this? So they go to the king of Bavaria and release this. Go, do you know that there's a foment of a secret society? And of course they didn't. So Adam Weishaupt wasn't prepared for this. And von Knieg, his sidekick, they weren't prepared. Their doors were kicked in by the Bavarian police. And they came in and they routed a lot of them. The Bavarian Illuminati was discovered in the 1700s, accidentally. And they were purged from Bavaria, totally. But they went underground. Because Weishaupt knew how to do that. He knew ahead of time. He had already got it into a cell structure, should this happen. But because it came out and above board, all the intellectuals of the world knew that the Illuminati existed. So the Duke of Brunswick finally gets up in France and goes, look, I've had enough. He goes, I am convinced that we as an order, look at the language, have come under the power of some very evil occult order profoundly versed in science, both occult and otherwise, though not infallible, their methods being black magic. That is to say, electromagnetic power, hypnotism, and powerful suggestion. We are convinced that the order is being controlled by some sun order after the nature of the Illuminati, if not by that order itself. Well, I don't know how more clear you can get. And he asked for the Masons to disband all over the world, literally the Masonic order to disband prompto. Of course, it didn't happen. Now, George Washington in his memoirs also warns about that. Um, they were more like guilds. They were more like the original builder, craft, guild types with a lot of occult ceremony, ritual, a lot of it which I think is very good. You know, uh, the, even today in their rituals, when the, you know, the Masons bring out their tools you know, for building, they bring them out on cushions, you know, they bring them out with great love and ceremony. There's nothing wrong with all of that. I think these were keepers of a certain kind of knowledge. And they were archivists. And just like librarians or archivists, doesn't mean that the guy who controls the archives has the faintest idea what's in the books. His job is just to keep it preserved, right? That's what the Jews are, the Israelites. They don't have a faintest idea what the Kabbalah is, but they've certainly kept it alive so that we have it hundreds of years later, right? An archivist's job is, I don't know what it is, but it's sacred, don't touch it. So they're great at archiving, thank God in a way, because then we've inherited all of this knowledge. I have never, never met a Mason to this day who's the faintest idea what their own order is about. And they were infiltrated because the Duke du Orléans, you, are, you have a place here called New Orleans? The Duke du Orléans, was one of the most evil, corrupt people on the earth. He was the head of Freemasonry during the French Revolution. And he is the one who sold out to the Illuminati. 
through him and his wife, they were able to infiltrate into France. And the f first lodge that fell to the Illuminati was the Grand Orient Lodge of, of, of France. And they had a lot of power, so through them, it started to infect everywhere else. And that's why these Masons are screaming against it, the other group. John Robinson, 1790. A book was published by a man that was approached by the Illuminati. He was a Scottish university teacher. Because the Illuminati, not stupid. Uh, Weishaupt said that we're only going to recruit highly intellectual people, if not dukes and princes. And he used to pose as a Protestant, saying that the Illuminati, you know how they used to sell it? Was Illuminatiism, Illuminism is an uh, is a, uh, alternative to Roman Catholicism. Remember, because what does Catholicism do? It forbids you to divorce and marry and all of these things that the princes and dukes didn't like. There was a lot of problems in the world with Roman Catholicism. So the selling point of Illuminism was if you join us and give us all your money, we will be a bastion that will eventually fight you know, Roman Catholicism. They forgot to uh, tell you, of course, that Weishaupt, the creator, was a Jesuit, ergo a Catholic, <laughs> right? But they thought this would work. So John Robinson of some university in Scotland was approached by them, found out what they were, and basically said, hell to the hell with this. And he wrote a book which is extremely rare in the world. It's called Proofs of a Conspiracy, right? And it was circulated in America. And from it, I have a copy of it. It says here, the great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Ne let it never appear in any place in its own name, but always covered by another name. This is Vaishap speaking. None, what? None is fitter than the three lower degrees of Freemasonry. The public is accustomed to it, expects little from it, and therefore takes little notice of it. So they're ready to infiltrate. General uh, F.C. Fuller says, he's a war historian, the government of the Western nations, whether monarchical or republican, has passed into the invisible hands of a plutocracy. International in power and grasp. It was, I venture to suggest, this semi-occult power which pushed the mass of the American people into the cauldron of World War I. Remember the pact? Of course they did. No less than George Washington. In the writings of George Washington, go to the library and pick it up. In volume 36, it says, I have heard much of the nefarious and dangerous plan of the Illuminati. I was, it, was not, it was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati and the principles of Jacobinism, Jacobinism is just the English word for the Illuminati, had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one, more, um, no one is more truly satisfied of this fact than I am. So next time they put you down when you start talk, talking about this and think you're just a weirdo, you know, know where it comes from. Alwai Alloy Hoffman, editor of the Journal de Vienna, this is one of the early periodicals in Europe, I shall never cease, he says, to repeat that the French Revolution has come about, come from masonry, and that it was made by writers right, and the Illuminati. Your own Joseph Willard, president of Harvard University, you'll note at his retirement he says this, right? There is sufficient evidence that a number of societies of the Illuminati have been established in this land. They are doubtless striving to secretly undermine all our ancient institutions, civil and sacred. We live in an alarming period. The enemies of all order are seeking our ruin. Should infidelity generally prevail, our independence would fall. Of course, our republican government would be annihilated, as it has been. Woodrow Wilson on his deathbed. Okay? This man served the Illuminati. He was a 33rd degree Freemason. He sold your country out to the Federal Reserve and whatever else. But even he at the end said, Something He said that some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of somebody or afraid of something. They know there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. Your president is saying things like that? What on earth is going on? Benjamin Disraeli. The government of this country has not only to deal with governments, kings and ministers, but also with secret societies, elements which must be taken into account, which at the last moment can bring our plans to nothing, which have agents everywhere who can incite assassinations and can, if necessary, lead a massacre. Edgar J. Hoover said to the American public, he said, the individual is handicapped by coming face to face with a conspiracy so monstrous he cannot believe it exists. That's part of the problem. Because we're all under anxiety from different, just the life itself. 
And they want that. They're feeding us a deluge, you see, of anxiety-driven stresses from the television and the media and the horrors and the wars and all of that. I go into this in the book about how that's done. Because then, you, yeah, you get so traumatized, your brain isn't able to sit and methodically work out a very simple thing, that there is control in the world. And it's a study like anything else, and it needs to be done in a, in a, a relaxed and, and, and educated way. How can you do that when you're strung out from everything else? Now, as I said, they have dynastic fights. Before he died, he said this, Kennedy, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths and secret proceedings. The high office, that was 61, the high office of president has been used to foment a plot to destroy the American's freedom. And before I leave office, I must inform the citizen of his plight. Where did he say that? Do you remember where? No. You'll remember he did leave office. Yeah. Not only did he want to put gold, right, money back on the gold standard, which is already suicide, but this is what he wanted to do. Whether or not he was serving the people or not, or whether it's just his dynastic Catholic side going to hell with the Illuminati, let's get them. He's talking to his Catholic brother. It doesn't matter. Here it is in the horse's mouth. He's not a maniac. He's literally telling you the presidency is, no, is under power. Of course it is. So to come to the sort of conclusion in the last uh, 40 minutes here or whatever, we want to look at, the, come full circle basically. In the Atlantis book at the end, in the sources, uh, uh, I mean in the solutions area of the book, since these characters have been around for at least 50,000 years and they've cer certainly been working overtime in the last 11,000 years to bring us up to the industrial age, the silicon age, you know, and move us forward into this highly technological era. We can assume then, can we not, that they're very close to replacing all the hardware. It's been 11,000 years. Here we are with the industrial age, uh, nations all saturated, you know, the tentacles of the British Empire alone have got their claws into every country, diamonds and, you know, slaves and opium and whatever. They've raped the whole of the earth for, this, for the ores and the uranium, the plutonium, what they're doing. So, and, and, and they're putting rockets up all the time. So we can imagine then that they're very close to at least getting their hardware back as they've been planning to do. So if these people have been moving in the world, which I'm more than convinced that they have been, what is going to happen? So in the end of the book, in the, in the solutions section, I outline four outcomes because ultimately a pyramid, I took, the, I took it from them, I took the idea from them. A pyramid by definition has four faces, right? We only see one side of it, which we take as the pyramid. But in fact, it has the same thing wherever you go. If you turn around a, go around a pyramid, you'll always see the same face. So in fact, the people at the top of the pyramid are aware that you have to have four separate strategies operating at the same time in order to get to the goal that you're in. And that's why I think the Knights of Templars often use the four symbol. Right? By the way, that is nothing but a pyramid seen from above. The Knights of Malta Cross, that's what it is. And in, in the way that they've controlled the human race is by the crown and the gown. The cross and the crown is the symbol of the Knights Templars, right? The Scottish Rite Freemasons use this symbol. The cross of monarchy and religion, the two mind-controlled devices that they've controlled the whole world. It's very easy to do. Or the double-headed eagle. The double-headed eagle does not mean, oh, it's the east and it's the west. It's religion and monarchy. You're going to be dumbed down by either one, either slaughtered or mind-controlled. That's why they've kept us together. People, people always tell me, you're crazy. No secret society could just walk in and take over. What are you guys all talking about? Well, as I didn't say that anybody came in and took over. These people have built our cities, created what we have. We're living in their world. Uh, less than uh, 200 years ago, before the agricultural revolution, nothing could have been easier. A man never strayed 10 miles from his own shack. You were a, fuck, you were a surf on the feudal man's land. You'd be put in stocks. You moved where you were told, <laughs> come in and take over. They were millionaires from the first centuries AD, the Phoenicians. Nothing could have been easier. And they had us under this kind of, you know, totalitarian control. They even tell you, in hoc sicne vigde, vigde, in this sign I shall conquer. As Jordan Maxwell says, it doesn't say, in this sign I will feed all the poor people. No, it says, I will conquer you, right, Charlemagne and Constantine. And the swastika being the four. And the pyramid being the four. So, okay, I took a page out of their book said, right, we've got four outcomes. There's four possible outcomes. There's probably many, but there's four that I could really think of. The one is called burn and rise no more. The two is called the bridges to Babylon. Then start the fuse 
and then Empire Strikes Back. The first possible outcome in a very short time, possibly within the next eight years, is number one, burn and rise no more. The progeny of Atlantis succeed in regaining all their technological hardware, especially that for breaking through the Stargate, and prepare themselves for departure. In so doing, they come out into the open more than ever, startling the human race who cannot comprehend what is happening. When they're out of range, they destroy our planet and all that lives on it. Criminals don't like to leave traces, do they? Criminals of this dimension, this level of magnitude, also will not. They've never liked it here. They didn't want to come here in the first place. When they prepared to leave, they found that they couldn't, and they despise us. And when they leave here, either just for kicks or because they just don't want to leave traces, they're going to deal with us. As V, remember V, the program V back in the 80s showed, and Planet of the Apes, yeah? When Charlton Heston sees the broken Statue of Liberty and he gets down on his knees and he goes, you, I can't believe it, you've done it, you actually did it. Incredible, you know, meaning there. All right, number two, bridges to Babylon. The masters re realize that no matter what they do, this is pretty much what they've already kind of understood, but they're still hoping for the best. But what happens if they really do find out that they can't vacate the earth? and that they're forever to be chained to the pit. In this case, they rule the world with unmitigated tyranny. See, one side of their pyramid, already one side of their own group, believe that we should have been doing that already. They have factions. They have four factions that sit at the table. They're all one group, but they have different voices. And one faction has already long ago believed that. But they're going to be the ones put in the chair if they feel that they can never leave. Then we're going to have the people who say, well, then let's just rule these people, not even give them any rights. They rule with unmitigated tyranny, relentlessly and openly. The human race loses whatever privileges it enjoyed while its utility was beneficial. Now it is deprived and slaughtered. Debauchery is everywhere and people even turn upon themselves, sinking into chaos of unimaginable proportions. With all the dark, repressed content of the unconscious and the consciousness in full view without the restraint of an inner or outer authority. The third one Start the fuse tector is a line that comes from the Sam Peckinpah movie, The Wild Bunch, that really shows how to fight fire with fire, if you have intention to do that. The good under the weight of the yoke. Maybe not now, but you can imagine tomorrow what would happen. The good under the weight of the yoke finally rise against their oppressors, actively preventing them from ever leaving and from taking their evil elsewhere. To do this, however, we end up having to sacrifice ourselves, taking them with us. That might sound preposterous, but if you watch Terminator 2, the movie, that's the implication. Remember the hero, the Schwarzenegger character at the end, dies in a pool of fire to save the two? That's the old Prometheus myth of stealing God, fire from the gods. It's the Christ myth. Right? It's the myth of the kings of Ireland. Do you know that that happened, nearly happened? About 7,000 years ago, there's a tale in the Irish legends where the king of the Gael, uh, the dark side, conjured up a demon they say, so powerful that the king of the Gales had to fight him himself. And to do that, he had to even leave his body. They actually tell you this, that the king had to stand, and he was in the battlefield, he's surrounded by nine bodyguards that protect the body of the king when he leaves his body, because these are realized beings. And he had to fight this monstrous demon that the enemy had uh, you know, conjured. And in order to even do that, he had to almost put up the whole of his race as sacrifice. But at least then, if he had destroyed this being, Evil would be destroyed, but so would they. So would we. So there's a precedence for that in the ancient legends. The fourth one is the true empire strikes back. Mankind finally discovers the correct means to the end and vanquishes its enemy with no excessive loss of life or home world. We eradicate the enemy and finally resolve the problem of evil. The beasts are slain, the damsels are rescued, and the ending is happy. How are we going to do it? We'll go into it in the book. Up until now, even with the vast majority of their sophisticated technical hardware again in their possession, the progeny of Atlanteans are not able to break out of the quarantine or out of their internment on the silent planet. The moon is not an ordinary satellite and no man has physically landed on the moon, though probes probably have. The commission to build a craft to go beyond the moon has been privatized recently, this, this last month or two. Paul Allen of Microsoft announced his prototype craft on May 15th, I'm very interested in symbolism. And May 15th, remember the Matrix movie came out in 515? May 15th? May 15th is called the Mercuralia. It is the day when the leaders of the world Illuminati meet in Italy. How come his craft for going up there 
is announced at, 11, at 12 o'clock Eastern time yeah, on the Mercuralia. How come the matrix comes out at the Mercuralia? Harp waves, microwaves, are continually being beamed onto the ionosphere to superheat the sky. One of the ways to get out of it, they just cannot find a way to get out of the, of the Stargate. So what they've done is they've invented microwave technology like Harp. And Harp is, again, not to do anything that they're telling you it's doing, because even Nick Bajic can't work out why it's a million times more powerful than it first said it was going to be. And what it's being used for is that it's mounted on satellites, and they're beaming it on the, on the, on the Stargate. Because if you're a burglar and you want to get in or get out, you can put a dummy wire on the uh, alarm system, can't you? You put a dummy wire and then you snip the original and you create a portal for yourself, right? And there's no alarm signal goes off. That's what they're hoping to do, but they do it with laser energy. But they haven't found the frequency yet. They're desperate to get to the moon to find if there's a keystone or a lodestone in the moon that they can disconnect. They've tried everything under the sun, even with the help of the microbes, and they still haven't done it. And we better hope they never do. But microwaves are being used to do it, microwave technology. The only trouble is that it's so damn hot that it's superheated the, uh, you know, the ionosphere and created what we know as the hole in the ozone layer. So when they're telling you, it's, oh, it's, uh, it's your aerosols, uh, it's a McDonald's carton, so hell, they'll say anything now. Yes, and CFCs have been an agricultural problem, and I'm, telling, I'm not doubting that. But that's not what created the hole in the blinking ozone layer, right? They literally, Nick Bajic says that they literally lifted the ionosphere like a pillow. It was so hot. They've been, there's been at least... I don't know how many nuclear explosions in space. They've, they've actually detonated nuclear explosions. If we had more time, I have the slides on that. But we just don't really have the time. The nuclear detonations on the moon. U.S. Project A119, nuke the moon. Rand Corporation Kellogg wanted to nuke the moon as early as 1956. NASA in 57 had a Project Red Sox where they actually did it. Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb, was eager to nuke the moon. The Soviets in 1950 had a project called Project E4 in which they did it. In 1962, another radiation belt was artificially created, right, accidentally, by the U.S. military when they detonated a megaton nuclear bomb 248 miles above the Earth in order to create a corridor, see, through the natural belts. Yeah, right. If they're natural, then you pass through them ordinarily. You don't need to create a corridor. The radiation from this detonation created a third belt. They made their own problem worse with 100 times the radiation of the other belts. That's probably what the Stargate also involved. I think the people who put it there knew that if you try to get out, you know, it's like sending... Remember that movie, um, The Fifth Essence, when they try to blast yeah. the incoming satellite? It makes it stronger. It absorbs the energy. Right. So this must have freaked them out. Sir Bernard Lovell said that the detonation was cataclysmic for the universe, for our star system. So these guys don't care how much they pollute. Coming up to the modern times, just examine the symbolism for a moment. This is at the time of the 9-11... Of the Janus was the god of the two faces, was he not? As soon as I saw this cover, it reminded me of the god Janus. We've been talking about having to look back and having to look forward. Well, if, if we need to do it, don't you think the Illuminati are doing it? Don't you think that they are, by definition, very, very much involved in always looking back and looking forward because that's their legacy? Janus is the two-faced god of the past and the future. Very interesting that they have that. In fact, when the Time magazine actually put out war, when they actually put out war on the Gulf, right, the special issue, look at the date. Janus, January. And here is the comical, you know, take on what they're doing, the Gulf War. But I thought that, yeah, okay, we've got Gulf in the war, we've got all the, all the cronies, but we've got this. I thought this was kind of unusual. What's that got to do with it? Unless we really see what's going on with all of that. So breaking through the Stargate, I thought this was interesting. They're going to give you symbolism now. They're going to be talking to you about it. About that the, what has this got to do with Desert Storm? I don't understand. But it's showing a person breaking through a barbed wire fence in Desert Khaki, you know, meaning a soldier in Iraq, but he's cutting through a barbed wire fence. Hmm. You see, Skull and Bones Man, what was his name that created the Time magazine? That creature, what was his name? Luce, Henry Luce. Do you know he was a member of the Skull and Bones Society? The combined military expenditures of all the world's governments in 1987, that's just in one year, 
were so large that all of the social programs of the United Nations could be financed for 300 years. So if there's poverty and starving and kids covered in flies and malnutrited mothers and we can't find no money to dig no wells and we just can't get it you know, organized, I think there might be a reason. 70 trillion, seven, is it seven? I hope it's seven, but even that's what, seven trillion dollars I believe has been spent on military budgets since the creation of the United Nations. 900 plus billion is spent on military budgets a year worldwide with 50% of that spent by the United States. Pentagon has spent 9,000 a second before the 9-11 uh, before attack. Michael Moore says the percentage of the US military spending that would ensure the essentials of life to everyone in the world according to the United Nations is a mere 10% of that, about 40 billion, which just happens to be the amount of funding initially requested to fund our retaliatory attack on Afghanistan. We're talking m minimal amount of money and we'd all be in a much better state in this world. So Brzezinski saying we need some cat catastrophe. Obviously the word 9-11, just the numbers represent what? Emergency, right? I mean. That was brought out very clearly early on. Ordo ab chao. Then something, as a person who's into mythology, I thought was very, very extraordinary, is almost as soon as we have the invasion, we have this story about the looting of the museums. Right? Remember that high-profile story? A lot of people covered it. At least 80% of the 170,000 separate items stored in the National Museum of Antiquities in Baghdad were stolen during the looting rampage that followed the U.S. military occupation. The museum is the only one in the world to house, probably, or have all the steps in the history of mankind, right? They literally have antiquities that show you every single step in the 11,000 years of the so-called official historical evolution. They have it. Somebody's trying to take that. Because you know why? I've heard that in, in those tablets, they actually show reptilian beings. And the morphing, you know, the genetic manipulation, they show that. The museum held the tablets. Well, after you have the democratize, so-called democratizing, after you have the Western cameras going in, you're hardly going to have them reeling on that when they go, let's see what the Iraqi uh, museum have to say about the evolution of mankind. And then we're all watching it on TV. Yeah, right. So they get rid of it. The museum held the tablets of the Hammurabi's Code, perhaps the world's first system of laws, an entire library of clay tablets had not yet even been deciphered or researched because of the U.S.-backed sanctions, you know, for the last 10 years. Well, <laughs> you're never going to get them translated now. Among the most priceless treasures is the vase of Uruk and the harp of Ur, dating back to 3000 to 2005 B.C., and the, ruler of, and the rule of the Sumerian kings. The exquisite bronze statue of Basitiki, Basitki, from the Akkadian kingdom is also gone, somehow hauled out of the museum despite its huge weight. That's right. A bunch of local yokels, looters, are meant to have walked in past golden masks and priceless treasures and just gone for an old stone basalt block that you need a crane to move, right? The 5,000-year-old vase of Uruk is the earliest known depiction of a religious ritual. Did you know that the Skull and Bones people stole the skull of Geronimo and have it in the, in the Yale University? They're into this because they use these for necromancy. And that's why they stole these. Yeah, and we can't find them. We don't know who did it. But all of it's been returned, haven't you heard? Yeah, well, of course. Yeah, you know what's been returned is facsimiles. Right. Most of the museums in the world, and the museum, uh, the museum presidents will even admit this, that most of what you see in museums is replicas. Very highly designed. There's a whole industry about creating replicas. Moyad. Demergy of the Iraqi National Museum said that the raid on the building was planned in advance by people who knew exactly what they were looking for among artifacts mainly unearthed during excavations between the First and Second World War. Now, conclusion. It has been of paramount importance for the Atlantean progeny to vacate this planet. To this end, they have forced technological advancement. However, their elaborate effort, efforts have proved unsuccessful. Therefore, in desperation, they're falling back on their final solution, something I haven't talked about yet. It was ordained in the days of old that at, as a last resort, if all else failed, the latter-day Atlanteans, right, the bloodkin, would unearth their masters from their secret places of internment and place them once again in charge of operations. These beings are not dead in the usual sense, 
and their places of repose are a well-preserved secret. When I said that these guys live for maybe five, seven hundred, even a thousand years, and implied that, okay, even though they have long lifespans, they finally do die, in fact, that is not the case. Because they were so scientifically advanced, they actually know how to suspend, you know, it comes with a territory when you're into genetics. I really don't know how it's done. I only come from the magical occult side, and I've studied the black magic arts, and they talk about it in necromantic terms and other things. There's a way to do it. Remember the old story of the vampire and they call him the undead? Right? That's what I'm talking about. It's some sort of suspended animation, probably to do with the limbic center. If you regress a person to their limbic center, even through hypnosis, time just slows down. Time is a concept and so is aging of our neocortex. So it has something to do with first regressing you probably to the limbic realm and probably something to do also with the DNA. And it could have many factors involved. But the main point is, that these characters, these original, remember the Council of Nine or the Thirteen who came to Babylon? Those guys are in a state of suspended animation somewhere under the earth buried. And they are the real Antichrist. What's the word Christ mean? It means uh, anointed one. But it also means made flesh. So, I hate to have to tell you this, but one of the big lads, the big boy, is buried, guess where? Yep. Not in Egypt, but somewhere over here. No. I'm talking about the, the fallen angels, the Nephilim kings. Like Tolkien showing, right, the Dark Lord and his gang. Now, they're obviously not going to tell you exactly where he's buried. Because even if the maps would be inaccurate, because that's obvious, I wouldn't put it on the map. But they know where it is. They know where these points are. Because in fact, a lot. Of, remember, the, remember, I told you the use of the monuments was to align the stars. There was eventually a second uh, level of why the monuments were built. Monuments of great geomantic and geomant geometric power were constructed to encapsulate the wisdom of a departed serpent on both sides. If a Lemurian prince fell and finally did die, just like we put up a grave stone, right, to one of our dead, they wanted to commemorate their fallen, you know, mystics or shamans or whatever you want to call it, and they would build a mausoleum. They would build literally what we call a cenotaph. They're not tombs. That's why you don't find bodies in a lot of them. But what they are are cenotaphs, right? And the dark side, they did the same thing as well because you want to encapsulate, do you not, the life of this remarkable person. So just like we would write a musical piece to a dead, you know, eulogy, they did it, but they did it in stone. Because the harmonics of the pyramid, of the, of the temple at, uh, you know, of the sun in uh, Mexico City or whatever, right, you know, are harmonically perfect. And that's their way of commemorating one of their souls that has departed. It also accounts for the reason why it is that when you go to one of these places, you have two types of response. Some of which you'll go to and you'll feel just so uplifted. The energy, you don't want to leave. You know, you feel it's like your second home. And then some of these famous sites that you go to when you go on holiday, you feel very different. You feel dark. You feel like something weird is happening, right? Because it depends on who's buried there or what kind of energy is commemorated there. And they work on this as well. Okay? So the serpent kings are buried or they're commemorated by these mounds. That's the second reason why these are done. All over the world, there's New Grange. Where we used to take the guided tour and go in there. This is an incredible mound where the, the rays of the sun, every, every, win every winter solstice, the ray of the sun passes through that door and into the inner side of the temple, and it falls on the back of a wall. And on the back of the wall where the sunlight, it's 17 millimeters long, a little beam of light, just like an in Indiana Jones, will, will come into the center of the temple, because this temple is based on the head chakra. And the sunlight coming in is enlightenment. And when the, when the, when the it's seven feet above the door. This stone, the sun passes across this stone, right? And as it does so, the shadow of the stone slowly creeps up and touches this stone. And as soon as the shadow touches the stone, this stone, the light goes in, almost like phallically, you know, into the temple and goes to the back of the wall. And that is where those three spirals are, right beside it. The Celtic three spirals you see are only found in one place in the world, and it's in that tomb. It's the most incredible place in the vortex it sits on, and it was built by the Tuatha Dé Danann. What is that? Where is it? 
It's called New Grange. Uh, in for what, what? What it was built for? As an astronomical uh, observatory and an homage to the goddess because the triple spiral is there. It's innumerable. And these are the stones I told you about yesterday, all the way around it, that have been turned inward. This used to have the whole of the epic of New Grange and the Celtic people, and only a few of these stones have little markings on them, which are very hard to see because they're eroded. <laughs> it doesn't even matter, does it, really, when three-quarters of them are blinking turned inwards when they, when they constructed this. And this is all quartz crystal, so you can imagine what it's like to be there. There's not a single ounce of concrete uh, 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 or cement has been used in that. The stones are laid over there, and for 7,000 years it hasn't budged an inch, and no architect can tell how it's done. It's the most incredible place. It's in the place called, it's north of Dublin. Just get, go to Dublin, take the I, the A1, uh, the M2 straight towards Belfast, and you'll pass right through that. You'll, you'll pass right by it, you'll see it. It's called Brook Boyne in Gaelic. And you should go there because um, the river that flows near it is, called, is the Boyne River where that great battle took place. You know where the Stuarts were destroyed and Protestantism came to, came to Ireland. It's near the Brook of Boyne. This is called Brook of Boyne. I wish I could even tell you some of the legends that are, uh, you know, the beautiful stories that are. This has also been called the House of uh, um, uh, Medir, M-I-D-I-R, who was like the Greek Sidonis. And uh, Medir used to sleep inside, they say, this handsome young man. And of course, it's all mythology, but the king, the king of the Dedanon would sleep inside and at night he'd be visited by the moon goddess because after the sun goes in, that same night on the three nights of the solstice, the moon comes in. And they have these incredible stories about the moonlight coming in and the young king in the myths. So the point is that these ancient burial grounds were also commemorations to the serpent masters. And if you actually look at a circuit board, some of these, like the temple at Edfu and stuff, are very similar to these processors. <coughs> Capital buildings, round circles, a lot of these places are also built over the sites of these graves. Because the word capital actually comes from two words, caput and tallus, meaning caput or caput draconis, which means the head and the tail of the dragon. So a capital building is literally a nexus point where the tail and the head come together. Capital. All over the world, we know about these famous sites, and some of them, which are very positive, and some of them are very negative, and we feel the energy there, because a lot of them are graves, or they are what we would call these commemoration sites all over the world. And more importantly, as Randy and other people have studied, is that the nexus points, this is a dodecahedron. The earth, the earth grid is a dodecahedron, okay? And a dodecahedron is made of five pointed. Each part of it is a pentagon. That's why the US Pentagon looks like one, because it fits probably right over one of the earth grid. It's incredible what they've been up to. See that as a pentagon? You see that shape? All right. So the pentagon is a very important part of a dodecahedron. Well, these graves are obviously not just put randomly. They're put at the junctions and the vertices of what are called the synchronic lines. One, ley lines, dragon paths, it's like your body. Your body has capillaries, right? It has, it has veins and it has arteries. Well, so does the earth, only they're etheric. Synchronic lines are her arteries. You cut a capillary, you barely notice it, you're alive, right? You cut a vein, okay, it's a few hours in hospital to get it patched up, put a plaster on it. You cut a synchronic line, an artery, you're dead pretty much, right? These individuals know how to mess with that part of it, and they're doing untold damage to the world. A lot of these graves are placed at what we call the synchronic lines. Four synchronic lines, which is very rare, cross in Italy at a certain place in Italy. It's one place in Italy where the four gigantic synchronic lines cross at one place, and you can go there. Is that common? Yes. Wow. Right? We'll talk about that later. Axiational lines are known that, as I said, the churches are, are placed on them. Washington, D.C., it all makes sense when you start to realize the geometry, not only of the buildings, but of the city itself. Okay, this subject, for anyone who's interested, is called archaeoastronomy. And there's people in this country and in Wales, all over the world. You can get a fascinating subject for those who are into it, about the earth grid and the natural vibrations of the earth. One of the other things that has been done just like you go for acupuncture when you're not feeling too well, 
the Earth, geomanticists, because these ancient people, both on the Lemurian and the Atlantean side, knew quite a lot about that. They'd put in what we now know to be obelisks or statuary or fountains at certain places, either to embellish the good energy there or to suppress it. Margaret Thatcher turned off all the fountains in London, and they're still off, to darken the energy, because fountains clean energy. These obelisks, and sometimes you feel very good, and sometimes you feel very negative. I've studied these in extensively, so, you know, in Ireland, Jesus, it's a whole other gig when you go near these places. Some of them are to, like a needle, they generate positive energy and keep the energy flowing, or they are put there to suppress good energy. You know, a good Celtic site, they'll put a church on it, or they'll put one of these monstrosities on it to suppress the natural energy, so every feel, everyone feels on a downer. Look at Paris, 12 striations, 12 streets heading straight into the center of the vortex. Remember I said cities are ritualistic places for the bloodletting? Richard Hoagland has found out that on the 33rd meridian of the Earth is where most of the world banks are. Most of the bombs that have been detonated in the world, most of the Illuminati Masonic lodges are all on the 33rd parallel. The place where wars are, are, are constituted are also on very important parts of the grid line so that the blood and the death and the horror of the troops will pour into the Earth and enter into the grid. Right? Through the etheric lines. And remember, soldiers are given, what are they given? They're given occult symbols to wear because it's ritual death. You've got to be dressed for that. Like the virgin has to be correctly dressed. Well, so do you. The virgin race has to be dressed. So they give you Maltese crosses, eagles, skull and bones, and pentagrams on these hellish war machines. You've got occult symbols. Why? Because it's an occult ritual from beginning to end. And the dead have to be in the ritual setting, in these meaningless rituals, like the First World War, and slaughtered in mass. And then the death energy of the cortisol goes into the earth and is fed off by these microbes. The ancient records indicate that it, was, that it was a practice in former ages of the mystery centers that directed civilization to hand out newly founded cities to the care of specific spiritual beings. That's David Overson's book. Perhaps it is su sufficient that we recognize as true the medieval arcane notion that such beings could be invited to participate in the life of a city by means of the spiritual art of astrology. So astrology is all in these cities and the layouts. In Ireland and England, it's replete. I can take you to things, show you things that will blow your mind, the orientations of these things. The leader of these mighty beings, because one of the words for these mighty, you know, angelic fourth dimensional beings, the macrobes, is cosmocrates, angelic beings. The leader of these mighty beings was due to take over the direction of Western civilization in 1881, caused considerable excitement in esoteric circles of Washington, D.C., and the occult world in general. So the occult tradition is into this. But disinterment, if they're going to disinter these beings, well, in Revelation 17 it says, look at the language, the beast that thou sawest was and is not yet shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall marvel whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was, is not, yet will be again. Yeah, something, something that was, right, has disappeared for a while, but is coming back, is what it basically means. Book of Baruch, remember, there were giants famous from the beginning that were so great in stature and expert in war. Book of Enoch, the child which is born to you shall survive on the earth, and his sons shall be saved with him. When all mankind who are on the earth die, he shall be safe, and his posterity shall beget on the earth, giants, not spiritual, but carnal. So we got warnings. Through the satellites that are put up there, they can now do scans of the earth, you see, because even in the time that's been elapsed, they may have even forgotten themselves where a lot of these masters are buried. So through the satellite pictures of underground, you know, you know how they can scan that and they can see underground lakes and stuff like that? Yeah, they ain't looking for underground wells and underground oil and all of that. That's part of it. They're looking for something a little bit more uh, intriguing than that. And it's the old case of X marks the spot. Whenever they find one of these graves, they move in. And as I said, I think it is in Iraq, the center of civilization, that some, at least one of these beings is there. And they're busy there to, to, to disinter them. But you can't really do, even though Saddam Hussein was in their pocket, and theoretically, they could have moved in their, um, you know, their sort of medical people, right? And they could have dug this, these beings up. I think they chose against it because the Iraqis would still be looking over your shoulder going, what's going on then, right? 
Because just like you've got the Christian world in total ignorance about any of this history, unfortunately, so is the Islamic world an artificially created fake religion, is it not, right? Believing in basically the same God. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity is the same thing in different guises. Still patriarchal, repressive, right? Religions. But that's good to keep people dumbed down for a couple of thousand years while you get, where you're busy controlling the world and doing what you're doing. So the Islamic people are as undereducated about their own ancient, you know, Persian, you know, Chaldean, right, Sumerian records as the Irish people are about the Celts and as the Western world is about the origins of themselves, right? Because they're walking around worshipping what they're doing. Islam, Muhammad, a, a modern day religion created 500 years ago. And do you think that they have a faintest idea what's 14 feet below their own sand? Of course not. So now comes the time to wipe them all out of the way because this is a big project. And what better way to do that than war? You move in almost with no pretext. You move in and you clear them all away because you don't want anybody looking over your shoulder and this is too dangerous. So they're going to send in their think tank people. They're going to send in their specialists. They're going to create, just like you see in the X-Files, all these buildings and makeshift domes and what have you. And they're going to be trying to un... And they have to do it at the right side of the real time. These people don't make mistakes. There's a lot of occultism to this. And how you dig them up, when you do it, and what, happen, what happens when they wake up. How are you going to handle these kinds of beings? It's going to be like the Highlander. Remember, because these people are generated by hate. They don't love each other. Even their masters have no care for them. What are you going to do when you waken up the Antichrist? Resurrection of the body, we are told. Yes, not reincarnation. I'm not talking about reincarnation. I am talking about literally resurrection of the body. The Bible even says that such a thing is possible when the graves open. That's what we're talking about. There's an ability to raise the dead in ways that we can barely understand outside fiction. And as I said, they've been telling us a lot about it. Do you know that the placement of these graves has also been specific? Because while these characters are lying dead, they still need some form of nourishment. That nourishment that not only is the energy that is being released from this planet, you know, in, 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 in horror and war and stress, being received by the macrobes, it's also flowing into the dodecahedron, into the earth grid, and, and pouring down into these graves energetically to keep these guys alive. Because they're vampires. How many are there? Uh, maybe no more than 13. I don't really know. Um, so have we not been told the feeding of the undead, the Holocaust, all the assassinations, right? what's happening in Northern Ireland, Palestine, Guyana? I got into what I'm telling you about when I was 13. I already knew what I'm talking about now because I discovered through studying things that I believe, just to give you a little anecdote into this, that one of these beings is buried in Palestine, which is the reason why there's so much foment and disorder there. Even if they're dead or they're not dead, just the fact that you put those bones there, geomancers know this, it's so tragic, it's so devastating, the energy that's released from these beings, that it contaminates the whole vibe of the whole place. And I would go, I would say, I'm pretty good evidence that somewhere in the Golan Heights or somewhere else, there's, there's a, a burial. And I know for sure that there's one there. I know where it is. And all I can tell you about it is that it's not a very pleasant place to be energetically. It's huge. It's an absolutely ginormous place, this earth, you know, megalithic site. And I found out after looking at this place that would you guess that the city hall of Belfast, which is one of those beautiful Venetian capital buildings, the spire of this building and this, this, this uh, burial site of one of these characters is exactly the center of the megalith is four megalithic miles to the center spire of the capital city. They're in alignment. Wouldn't that be interesting, right? So I tried in my own pathetic, amateuristic way to do something about that uh, area and uh, to no avail because these places are protected. But all the slaughters, you know, have we been told all along, nuclear war, atomic war, Cold War, Star Wars? Wait a minute, remember we were talking about etymology? What are we talking about here? Nuclear war, atomic war, cold war. Do these not tell you exactly what kind of war it is? It's not, they're not, that doesn't mean bombs raining from the skies. It means literally what it says, a war of your DNA, a war of our atomic structure, a war within. They create one out there, or they create the threat of the Nazis, the threat of Russia. Right? You know who, how the Russians got all their guns and bombs? From New York, from blinking Armand Hammer and his gang. 
right? And Cold War, yeah, of course it's called Cold War. They know it's never going to heat up. It's a cold internecine war within your own DNA. And the daily diet of news full of horror and injustice is indeed a diet. It serves to stimulate and generate precisely the kind of emotional reactions required to sustain the demonic presences which prey over us. The news and the newspapers read by everyone everywhere fill readers and audiences with dread, fear, and futility. These softer reactions still drain energy from us and from the erstwhile victim. The energy released from your own living room conducted via the ambient electromagnetism goes into the earth grid and feeds these monsters, let alone the wars and horror, horrific serial killings and everything else. You know, how, how come it is always after they've killed seven or 13 victims that they suddenly catch the serial killer? Seven, 13, occult numbers. Now, these underground chambers were constructed using pure charged crystals and other magical techniques to help attract, contain, and generate the energy released through the grid. Remember Superman in the movie when he flies north to his uh, citadel? It's all crystalline inside. Something like that. That's a good right, representation, but they have similar things under the earth. It's a hollow earth concept. Large doses of fear, trepidation, and agony were released, were they not, during 9-11, not only from New York, but all over the world. This event was staged in a site of a powerful vortex. Yeah, Kennedy's killing the 33rd meridian of the earth, a junction of three roads on November 22nd, which makes 33. 11, 22 is 33, the 33rd degree Masons. He was shot at the 33rd meridian of the earth and at the junction of three roads. They don't get a thing wrong. August 31st, 1997 is the day that Jack the Ripper killed his first victim. It was August 31st, 100 years to the day. When, that, when Lady Spencer was murdered in France at the junction of three roads in the underpass of the underworld at the 13th pillar on that date. Exactly on this date, the constellation of Virgo, which rules the Virgin, sinks into the underworld. And it rises back at the assumption of the Virgin Mary in the Roman Catholic calendar about a month later. The death of the Virgin is ritualistically done. David Icke's book, The Biggest Secret, has a whole chapter on it. As I said, Kennedy's killing, 33rd meridian of the earth at the junction of three roads on the, on the Masonic day. They all have code names, right? Their secret security guys have their code names. Kennedy's code name fits mythology. In ancient mythology, the Sun King, after he dies to go into the underworld, right? To go through his great initiation. And it's at the place of Sagittarius, by the way, where this happens. Because the Milky Way runs through Sagittarius and Scorpio, right? When the hero, which is the sun, enters that small little decanate part of the zodiac, he is called the Traveler. Do you know what the secret code for the security guards for Kennedy was? The Traveler. 33 cubes on the memorial for Kennedy. 33. The rape of the planet Earth, the pollution and desecration of oceans, forests, jungles, and atmosphere are also part of this. Because if they also mess with our environment, we feel stressed. Right? So the pollution of the Atmosphere also contributes, the death of nature contributes to this, and it's in preparation for the arising because they don't like it. They don't like the air, they don't like the oxygen, the ozone, any of that. They hate that. And many movies, uh, Asha's kids were telling me a whole slew of other ones they've watched when I was discussing this whole thing with them. But so many movies actually deal with something coming up from under the earth or a lot of the actions taking place under the ground. Now, of course, these people aren't stupid. In necromantic uh, types of ritual, you know, there's lots of things that could go wrong. So they have to have backup plans. You can't just press a button and hope that you know, these beings wake up. They've been there probably for more than 13,000 years buried. And if you wake them up, there's no, there's no thinking they might even be sane. <laughs> right? So they got backup plans. I'll share one of them with you. One of the things that they'll do is quickly move. If there's something wrong in the experiment, what they're going to do is immediately through a cavalcade, through some sort of caravan, either by train or by plane or jet or whatever, or airplane, I don't know how, they've got contingents of people with different backup plans. So if one fails, they just sweep this group aside and another group come in. They've got probably about 10 different, totally separately funded groups who've been working on this problem with different solutions just in case one doesn't work. The men in white coats. And the, one of them that I think is the most important is that they're going to take this being to the Great Pyramid. At this time right now, they're already constructing a wall around the pyramid, 22 feet high, with gun turrets all around Giza Pyramid, right now as we speak. 
And people have wondered why that is. Because one of the things about the pyramid is it does have certain properties. And in times past, you see, monatomic substances were given to these beings. And there's certain properties there. So they may take this leader there straight away if there's something going wrong. Does Daniel last know this? He's part of it. He should know it. Okay. And maybe you're going to say, but, but what, is, what are these beings going to do? They're, trying to, they, they're hoping that they'll have the key to the Stargate. Because they've tried everything else and they can't get out. So they're thinking that only with one of these beings being resurrected again, or they might even have found the way out and they're ready to awaken them to get out. I don't think that's the reason. I think it's in desperation. I think that they're awakening them because only they have the intelligence. Now these guys are going to wake up and go, you mean to tell me that you, we, we've been around, we, we've been waiting, you come back 11,000 years later and you go, hey, boss, uh, we don't know what, uh, how to do it. <laughs> that's not going to work, you see. So they don't even know that there might be a retaliation because none of these guys have any love for each other. Yeah, we blew it. You know, that's not going to sing too well. But more importantly is, haven't you seen that after every little creature that hatches needs more food? I've just been describing to you what food they need when they're sleeping. When they wake up, they're going to need food. They're going to need infusion, aren't they? <laughs> Wouldn't the Iraqi war perfectly provide that? As a prelude to digging them up, you have a blitzkrieg. So that... They're feeling the energy coming through, just like in Highlander, J uh, when they're just about to wake up. Hey, we fed you. You know, you should be happy. So they're existing in the uh, that, uh, macro plane that you were talking about. They're Both the macrobes and these physical beings. Yeah. Both. Both ends of the spectrum. Because they're trying to get off of here. Atlantis. That's the agenda. All right. What's the positive side? Yeah. Gentleman here was asking that repeatedly. There are many answers, but let's just look at one. Everything happens for a reason. Everything is part of the karmic destiny of an individual or a planet in the continuum. All right, so 122112 comes along. But they're saying that there's also this phenomena that they're describing as the photon belt, meaning that they found that photonic energy, which is the highest form of light that could be known physically, without you talking about some spiritual thing. The highest manifestation of physical light is the photonic light. And they claim that our Earth and our solar system and possibly even our galaxy is going to pass through a belt of photonic energy pretty soon. Some people have said we're already in it, or at least we're in the margins of it. Right? If that is the case, then according to what you read when you read about photonic energy, that will take care of a lot of things. Because the photonic energy is basically the interface to spirit. It's the highest form of what we know to be light. But because it's so close to the other side, to the quantum level, it is very much a spiritual form of energy. Therefore, it is, it is capable of clearing all forms of filth and degeneracy. And it's part of the nature. You can't fix it, right? I mean, even these guys with their intellects can't fix that. You can't stop nature. So the roach cleaner is coming. <laughs> and he's not going to stop, right? It's like that movie I've seen, Arachnophobia, where the, uh, who's the guy that uh, I love, you know, uh, the, uh, Goodman, Bill Goodman? He like walks up, he's the roach killer, and he's coming up. <laughs> Nothing on earth can stop the guy, you know? If that entity comes in, Mother Nature comes in, even these roaches are going to run. Because this spiritual light is going to incinerate them and anything of their ilk because of their consciousness. It's the spring clean. It's the car wash. That's probably why they want to get out of here so bad. Exactly. That's exactly what I was coming to. Why the speeding up of time? Why the hurry? Why digging up the bosses? Why even th that threat right, that they, they could die themselves, just these entities waking up? Because they're in a hurry. It's DEF CON 1. Nature is waking up. It's 2012. The Mayans have said it. You're not going to get away with it. Right? There was a certain time frame to this. The Mayan thing is not a prediction. It's, not a it's a prophecy, but it's not a prediction of some dude in his garret like Nostradamus. It's written by the same gang. If you know the end plan, then you know when we're coming down you know, to the ticking hour, where it's coming close to that point. We're in the red right now. And the whole human race is, 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 is part of it. The new millennium is part of it. By 2012, and possibly even by 1997, this is all going to be history already. It's already going to be too late. But let's just examine something about the photon belt. Robert Stanley reported on the discovery that there was a photonic energy by satellites in 1991 and he says, these excesses of photons are being emitted from the center of our galaxy. That's very important. Our solar system enters this area of our galaxy every 11,000 years. That's debatable. A lot of people are saying that, you know, they're trying to estimate the cycle. 
That's where I'm a little bit uh, disagree. But let's just see what they have to say. They say that this alignment happens every 11,000 and then passes through for 2,000 years while completing its 26,000 year galactic orbit. All right, so they're very specific there. They're saying that we're out of it for about 10,000, 11,000 years, and then we pass through it, and the, and the passing through lasts 2,000 years. The only trouble with that is it presupposes that everything in nature is purely orbital, or uh, sorry, cyclical, right? That it's a repeatable pattern every so many thousand years. In fact, you now the quantum scientists like Nazim and people have found that that's not true. Nothing moves in a fixed circle, nothing. It moves in a spiral. Right? So who's to say that this part of the spiral isn't going to be quant uh, you know, exponentially bigger this time and then ne next time, right? So the dates may not be accurate. Yeah, it may have been that time, the last time it came around, but how do you know it's not exponentially larger the next time? You know, the Fibonacci series, everything grows in a bigger spiral. You can't talk about fixed like a clock, you know, okay, it just goes round and round and round. That's kind of erroneous. By means of satellite instrumentation, astronomers in 1961 discovered what appeared to be an unusual nebula. We normally understand the nebula phenomena as a vast cloud-like mass of gas and dust. This one, however, appeared to have anomalous properties and was named the Golden Nebula. The public's attention was not drawn to this unusual revelation until much later, presumably when it was realized that this nebula's location was coincident with the projected orbit of our solar system. Around the early 1980s, a radio announcement in the U.S. was made that our solar system was in fact going to collide with an electromagnetic cloud in the not too distant future. Caused by the precession of our solar system and its accompanying planets around the central sun called Alcyone, located in the constellation of Pleiades, this counterclockwise cyclic precession around Alcyone requires 25,860 years to make one complete orbit. Our present day sun, moon and planets must pass twice through the photon belt during this time. That is once to the north and once to the south. During this cycle, there are two periods of darkness and two periods of light. The periods of darkness which constitute the vast majority of the rotation around the central sun consist of two periods of 10,500 years. No, that's when we're not in it. Following each period of 10,500 years of darkness, then we emerge into 2,000 years of total light, which actually constitutes the photon band. And there's diagrams, you know, giving more illustration. We just don't have time to study them all. The 2,000 year and the, uh, the periods of darkness, all debatable. But in brief, a summary, it says the photon belt was discovered in 1961 by satellite born instruments. It comes around every 10,000 years and lasts for 2,000 years. Earth thought to have entered the outer perimeter in 1962. The sun's radiation will be altered because of it. Electrons will be affected and they will generate photonic radiation. As soon as we enter the photon belt, even the normal electrons, because photons are a discharge from an electron, all the electrons will start moving into photonic levels. Everything, the walls, your skin, the rings I'm wearing, you know, everything. Nature will start to light up. It's going to be unbelievable. They talk about this. If the sun enters first, right, and they don't know which one will happen first. If the sun enters the belt first, just because the way our orbit is spinning, it will disappear and darkness will ensue Right, for a few days, that's called the days of night, right? If the earth goes in first and the sun's on the outside for a while, then the entire sky will appear to be on fire. So potluck, whichever one it's going to be. All things will emit light and phosphorescence. Darkness will not exist. An upgrade from the 22 codons to 64 will happen in our DNA. Nothing of negative energy is going to survive even half of that. And the Nephilim know it. So it's not just, hey, boss, uh, we're kind of stuck here. It's worse. They're going, we're caught <laughs> after all these years, you know. So they're going to move. They're in a hurry. Uh, that's another cycle we don't have time to examine. I'm, I, have a, I have a miscellaneous, you know, of different interpretations to what could happen. Because some people refute it's going to be a photon belt. Some people are talking about it's another kind of alignment. The, to me, again, like I said earlier, the, the physical manifestation of the phenomena is really not that important. You know how it's coming. Is it a Smith & Wesson or is it a you know, Colt 45? The bullet, you're dead. It doesn't really matter, does it? You know, so it's like, okay, there's different ways that this can happen, but these are all levels of interpretation. Ultimately, it's a spiritual change that's coming down. In 2012, the plane of our solar system will line up exactly with the plane of our galaxy. Hell, that alone is incredible. 
right? That means the plane of our solar system will align up exactly with the plane of our galaxy, the Milky Way. This cycle has taken 26,000 years to repeat. The alignment was recorded by the Maya, whose calendar was said to arise from a phenomena referred to as the sacred tree, a central motif of the creation myths. The god of the sun, Pakal, Lord Ahu, was depicted as entering into the tree during his death. So there's the whole tree and hero myth again. We've seen that. But it represents a cosmological event. Well, the Scandinavians had their world ash tree, right? The, the Yggdrasil. Now, the incredible Maya site of Palenque is filled with sacred tree motifs and references to the astronomical events. In their book, Forest of Kings, Scheele and Friedel suggest that the sacred tree referred to the ecliptic, which it does. Apparently, that was only part of the picture, for the sacred tree of Pakal ascends in death, that he ascends in death, is more than just the ecliptic. It is the sacred doorway to the underworld. The crossing point of the Milky Way and ecliptic is the doorway that represents the sacred source and origin. So if you just take that alone, there's an alignment opening portals to higher energy. When the planet, the sun, and the moon entered the dark cleft of the Milky Way in Sagittarius, which happens to be exactly the center of the Milky Way, entrance to the underworld road was possible. Right? So the center of our galaxy is in the sign of Sagittarius. That's why the Sagittarius symbol is an archer. Because the bow, originally, the arrow was facing galactic center, which was the target. That's why they designed that symbol. It's also where the pole of the Earth is. The pole of the Earth goes from Gemini, Taurus, down to, to Sagittarius. Sagittarius is very important. Which could take the journeyer to the heart of the sky. This dark area up the center of the Milky Way has been called the dark road, you know, the road to Shibala, Camino de Santiago, the crossroads. It is really where the galactic center crosses the ecliptic. Now, when those two things align, the sacred energy of the universe that's pouring down from there is enough to clean the Earth and the solar system. Photon belt or none. Just the alignment alone creates a portal in which nothing dark can last, because that's the central sun, the black sun, the center of the galaxy. The Smithsonian Institute use a black sun as one of their symbols. The swastika used to actually be called the black sun. The fall equinox, right, that's the autumn equinox sun, conjuncted the sacred tree about 6,400 years ago, 14th of a processional cycle. Ancient cultures in Mesopotamia may have recognized this alignment and called it the golden age. The fall from this state of alignment may be responsible for the original fall from paradise. Terence McKenna demonstrates that on the winter solstice of 2012, galactic center will be rising heliacally, that means with the sun, just before dawn. Okay, we're very close to the end. The Maya were aware of our solstice sun's impending alignment with the galactic plane and the galactic center. I honestly have documented my encounter with this idea and have gone deep into the academic literature to decode how this end date alignment scenario, what I call the galactic cosmology, was incorporated into the myth. The amazing fact, the ancient Meso Mesoamerican sky watchers were able to pinpoint a winter solstice far off into the future, has not been dealt with by the Mayans. Uh, not been dealt with by the Mayanists. Why did they choose the year 2012? One immediately gets the impression that there is a very strange mystery to be confronted here. Why did early Mesoamerican sky watchers pick up a date of some 2,300 years into the future? See, they're all asking this. Why would even somebody be wanting to do that? Here is the divination prediction for that day, because there's no Mayan predictions for any time after 2012. There's only one for that day. The very first day. Apu, the sun, Ahu, the sun, Agapu, is the light from which we emerge and the light to which we will all return. A year of the vision of the eagle, right, and its connection with grandfather's sun and the solar mind. The lord of the age of flowers, balance in the material and physical world. Right, this is a prediction. So there'll be balance in the material and physical worlds. Strong, intelligent, hardworking, yet tender and brave. This year anchors a spiritual certainty and the understanding of cycles of time and the interdependence of all living things. It offers us the ability to use the creative power of the universe. We will pass many tests of the mind and will. Remember to act from trust. So it looks like a little divination prediction for an individual, but it's not. Magnify that to the whole planet. This is a prediction for the planet, that harmony is coming. The, the unification of the inner and the outer is coming.
Yeah, the 12 strand RNA DNA system will have replaced our body's current two strand system. We will have increased our seven chakra system of body energy vortexes to the 13 chakra system. We will also consciously use 100% of our brain instead of the 10 to 20% currently utilized. Full consciousness will return. For epochs, let's, uh, let's see how much there is to go of this. Hang on. Where did you get that last one from? That one? That's a website right there, 2012.com, AU. No. I have it on my other documents, but I, for the slides, I have it limited. Okay, for, remember I talked about outcomes one and two? Of all the four outcomes, the first three aren't very pleasant, right? Especially one and two. Well, if those were to happen, we got to look at something here, because it says, for epochs, the Schumann resonances have provided the orchestrating pulse of life on the planet, our planetary heartbeat, which sets the tempo for health and well-being. The ELF wave frequencies of the Schumann resonance are in intimately connected with those of the human brain waves. Natural or artificially induced changes in the Schumann you know, resonance affect the subtle and perhaps gross brain wave function. So as the Schumann waves of the Earth change, our mentality changes for, for good or for bad. Liquid crystals, DNA, liquid crystals, which is DNA, brain ventricles, and cellular structure in the human body may operate as an antenna for detecting and decoding such global and local ELF signals, meaning your body's tied to it. There is a harmonic relationship between the Earth and our mind-body. Earth's low frequency isoelectric field, the magnetic field of the Earth, and the electrostatic field that emerges from our bodies are closely interwoven. Our internal rhythms interact with external rhythms, affecting our balance, REM patterns, and mental focus. And I say, or is it the other way around? Is it the mental, emotional, and psychological states of human beings that are causing the changes in the electromagnetism of the planet? You see, what you'll notice in the previous scientists I was you know, reading to you is that they're not Jungians. They're not Freudians, and they're obviously not very mystically inclined because they still fail to understand that our mind's consciousness affects what happens outside more than the other way around, especially when it comes to these things. So if the, if the Schumann waves are bouncing back and forward like they are now and dropping through the floor, and we go, oh, well, isn't it, isn't it the cop-out of the ego to say, well, it's happening in nature, so look at the mess we're in. Too bad that. No, 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 no. If disaster is happening outside, its root is in here. And until the human race understands that, nothing is going to change. And then, like insurance guys, we cop out, go, act of God, freak of nature, what can we do? Let's start civilization over again. But we're okay. We, did, we, were, we, were get, we were getting there. Baloney. Earth doesn't attack us. We do it the other way around. So I actually have the reverse. I have a Reichian theory. I have a Jungian theory about this. That we, by not looking at our emotional bodies, by not dealing with the spiritual within us, are causing this pestilence to happen, probably even including the infection of the Nephilim in the beginning. That's the spiritual analysis of this. The Mayan calendar is the only calendar known to be based on galactic cycles. The Maya claimed to have created this calendar in order to monitor the light coming from the center of the galaxy and how it affected our DNA. Look at that. We now know through the work of Fritz Popp that DNA not only absorbs light, but also emits light. Right. Emits light. DNA also appears to be the bridge between our physical and etheric bodies. Modern science now realizes that our DNA directly reflects our consciousness, making it possible for us to willfully change our DNA. Earth's background base frequency, or heartbeat, the Schumann resonance, is rising dramatically. Though it varies among geographical regions, for decades the overall measurement used to be 7.8 cycles per second. This was once thought to be a constant. Recent reports set the rate at over 11 cycles and climbing. Science does not know why or what to make of it. The collapse of the Earth's magnetism field, which both guards the planet and guides many of its creatures, appears to have started in earnest about 150 years ago. Science reporter Bill Broad has filed a report which explores how the field's strength has waned 10% to 15% so far, and this deterioration has accelerated of late, increasing debate over whether it portends a reversal of the lines of magnetic force. Broad explains, during a reversal of, you know, of, the, of magnetic waves, the main field weakens, almost vanishes, and then reappears with opposite polarity. Afterwards, compass needles that normally point north would point south, 
and during the thousands of years of transition, much in the heavens and the earth would go askew. Broad claims a reversal would, could knock out power grids, hurt astronauts and satellites, widen atmospheric ozone holes, send polar auroras flashing to the equator, and confuse birds, fish, and migratory animals that rely on the steadiness of the magnetic field, right? So basically, chaos. Well, that's already happening a little bit. It is. It's happening now as we speak. Photon, and Deepak Chopra says that photons come out of nowhere. They cannot be stored. They can barely be pinned down in time. And they go, have no home in space whatsoever. That is, light occupies no volume and has no mass. The similarity between a thought and a photon is very deep. Yep, he's on to the right track. Both are born in the region beyond space and time where nature controls all processes in that void, which is the creative intelligence. Now, we're talking about outcomes one and two. What happens if the Illuminati guys know this and start to interfere with our consciousness as they're doing through mind control and other means in order to precipitate changes? It's called... The negative changes. Because remember, if we have outcome one or two, then they're not getting off and they're going to rule us, right? Or if it's outcome one, they leave, but they want us all running around like the headless chickens and they can watch it on a video cam and think, ha ha, great. Armageddon. Armageddon, yeah, which many movies have predicted. Yes, and many movies have shown that, right? Blade Runner, you know, all these movies have shown the atrocities, the Armageddon. They want that. They want the re they're, they're sucking off release of our emotions. What better than to have us all running around strangling each other in a great conflagration, which is the rapture, which is the whole tribulation. It's called entrainment. And great scholars like Jim Keith have exposed this. Could you control people if you could project holographic images into the sky, pictures of gods they worship or of demons they most fear? The Air Force thinks so, and they're actively pursuing holographic projectors as a weapon system. What could you do if you could transmit words or thoughts directly into their minds? Could you not bend them to your bidding, unawares, or drive them insane with voices? Yes, like Jordan Maxwell says, they could project into the sky that the UFOs are coming to save us. Great, it's Flash Gordon, here he comes. And then we're all like ready to you know, go down that road, thinking that the aliens are coming back and they're going to save us. And they can do it very easily because they've set up these cell towers where if they turn those on max, there ain't going to be much left. People be walking around like the night of the living dead. And we have a problem, don't we? Because we've already got that schizophrenia inside ourselves, and we've already got an unconscious full of repressed content. Changes within the mental reactions of humans, whether induced artificially or not, may precipitate the earth, the so-called earth changes, and specifically the photon reaction. That's my statement. That's what I more believe. That earth responds to us because we are its lymphocytes. We are its progeny. We are its cell thoughts. The resulting anarchy, nihilism, and debauchery, the loss of moral prohibitions, as well as certainty and normalcy, will trigger mass insanity on a global level. The return of the repressed content will mean loss of the neocortical intelligence and prefrontal centering. As the higher centers of the psyche suffer trauma and overload, we will see man regress to a limbic form of consciousness. Remember H.G. Wells and the uh, Morlocks? Barbara Han Clow agrees. She says, you have miasmas in your bodies that you must release. This is her guides told her this. These are etheric masses that hold memory of genetic past life uh, patterns. These miasmas are being intensively activated by the photon band. See, in other words, unless we clean our house, we're susceptible to the toxic overload later on. There's the move from Aquarius into Pisces. Say you don't believe anything about the photon belt, but you're an astrologer. Well, we're moving out of Pisces and moving close to the age of Aquarius. Moving from what? A mutable water sign into a fixed air sign? And there's not going to be any change? <sighs> Gender alone will, will, will be incredibly changed because of that. Okay, the last few slides. About seven minutes left. Bringing it right up to date, we're talking a little bit about the reasons for the Gulf War is to precipitate a smoke screen so that they can dig up the, these Nephilim leaders. What's happening now? We got a new gang in town. Well, but it's, Bill Clinton was actually a Rhodes Scholar and was sent to Oxford. Cecil Rhodes was the founder of Rhodesia, right? Rhodes, Rhodesia, and created the secret, super secret elitist roundtable group, which subsequently formed the Royal Institute of International Affairs, of which Kissinger, Holbrook, and Brzezinski are all part of 
and the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, which in turn control every aspect of American economic and social life. The U.S. presidents work for these institutions and not for the people. Bill Clinton was merely a lower level pawn to get his wife, Hillary Clinton, into the U.S. political arena. That's the truth. Kerry will be in because it is Masonic policy to bring in the so-called New World Order on the back of a democratic government. You know the reason why that is? Is because when the Jacobin Society came to this country, they changed their name and they called themselves the Democratic Society. So the Illuminati were originally called the Democratic Society that changed its name to the Democratic Party. They are the Illuminati. And so it's part of their little you know, routine, their ritual, that when you actually do insert the New World Order, it comes on the back of a socialist, appearing socialist, or Democratic Party. See, Democratus comes from the Greek demos and kratos, two words, which they tell us connotates to mean people rule, right? Meaning rule, the people rule. Actually, it doesn't mean that. It means people ruled. And there's a difference. People under rule. Okay, so what are we saying here? Masa he will be in because it's part of their pact to bring it in on a democratic government. The reason for this has nothing to do with actual democracy. The Illuminati control the Skull and Bones order, of which Kerry and Bush are both initiates. The people are getting behind the new JFK, right? John, John Forbes Kerry, because he appears liberal, caring, and proactive. But he has a reputation for vacillation and ambiguity. This is part of his act. He's Irish. Yeah. To make him seem just, just a little impotent. So that will counterpoint Hillary Rodham Clinton's masculinity when she is now brought in a Secretary of State or whatever, you know, a very, she, he's going to be bringing her in. Yeah, when, when HRC is made his secretary or vice president or given some other major role like ambassador to Britain or whatever, she will be seen as a publicly as being stronger than Kerry because it's already cultivated this, I don't know bit, right? You know, good cop, bad cop, right? Uh, who may even be made to make designer mistakes. What happens if after he gets in, he's even made to make even big designer mistakes and then in jumps Hillary to save his ass, right? It can be done. The agenda is to make HRC look strong. But even before their term, there may be a major reversal in the personality of Kerry. Because isn't it obvious that Kerry's not going to backpedal on the Patriot Act after he gets in, and he's not going to backpedal on Homeland Security? But then how is he going to justify that he's going to keep it going? Right? Because he's meant to be a good cop who's going to rescind all of this and get us back to normalcy, right? Help is on the way. But then how is he going to be the, how is he going to lose that mask later on? There must be an incentive. So a possible scenario, just before leaving office, George W. Bush is assassinated and Kerry is sworn in under emergency acts and, has just, and ha now has just cause for casting aside his good guy image and he, in effect, becomes George W. Bush number two, keeping the Patriot Act in place, perhaps even signing in martial law, ultimately moving the New World Order agenda even further. He's skull and bones after all, isn't he? And do you know what the code name of George W. Bush is to the secret police and his bodyguards? Temporary. He won't be shot. He'll appear to be shot. They can cover it up. He's one of them, so they're not going to do it physically. They just want him out of the way so there's no tracking. Part of the way he's been so flagrantly tripping over himself, even with the stuff that he's been doing, is because he knows he's not going to be around to go to court or ever have any of these lawsuits. He'll be officially dead. That's why they can blunder and not have to worry about it. That's my scenario. I've said it many times. Hillary Rodham Clinton is connected to the Tudor dynasty. Partly Jewish, too. She worked for the Rose Law Firm in Arkansas, right? 30 years they sat up ahead of time just to get her in. She's the controller. She is connected to Rhodes Scholarship, not Bill. He's just a fall guy. That's why you can have as much sex, do what you like, get out of the way, wait for the one who really matters to get in. It's all part of the symbolism of the Whore of Babylon idea, the female. America has a Statue of Liberty. America is born under cancer, the female sign, right? Margaret Thatcher was put into place to destroy England, the female. They need the same. They, this country has had one missing thing, a female president. By 2008, you'll have one. We end with the solutions. And they're my solutions. As I told you, you know, we all think for ourselves. If I've been studying all of this, I have to have something to say about the solutions. It would be madness not to offer that. So my solutions are, first of all, what are the reasons for why a lot of this is happening? Well, one of the reasons is that America is simply moving from infancy to adolescence, purely just historically. So it's merely experiencing early puberty. 
Remember Gulliver's Travels? Our Gulliver washes up on the beach, isn't it? Yeah. And then he washes up and he falls asleep or something like that. And the Lilliputians come and they tie him down. That's America. Bush and his cronies and Clinton and his cronies and the whole gang of them are nothing but Lilliputians. They have no power. From down there when you're sleeping, they look big. Because there's two ways in life to look, look big and, and think that you have power. One is by genuinely ascending yourself, right, spiritually. And the other one is to artificially degrade everybody else so that by standing still, you look big. We, you, have all been suppressed. All your fathers have been degraded and kept poor and kept stupid and kept, you know, worked to death and in anxiety. So we look up to the bushes as if they're the giants. You know when Gulliver awakens, when this country awakens? You're going to go like that to the bushes of the earth and put them where they belong. Like the people in my country have done it over the years. There's a price of freedom and they're going to learn it. Freedom and individuality are virtues which must be earned. Power and genius, like light, attracts pests. The reason why this country has suffered under these people is because this country had something magnificent to start with. Not only a great you know, spiritual destiny, but incredible ability to change the rest of the world and the destiny of the world. That's what Thomas Paine and de Tocqueville and all of these others were talking about who really believed in this country, like Edmund Burke. But you see, that attracts all the pestilence, doesn't it? They can't have that rise. You, you really couldn't have a republic that would rise and, and this whole occult agenda would be stymied. And as I said, it just hasn't been the right time. 20th century is a problem think. We're only moving in. We're only four years into a solution think period. You know, my work is certainly part of that, but we're all going to have part of this. A little bit deeper level. One of the biggest solutions, and I put it number one for a very important reason because I think of it as number one, deal with the cleansing and healing of your own emotional body. Because if you don't, then you're dead already. Because nothing can have power over you if you are constitutionally strong inside yourself. Bruce Lee knew that. The martial artists know that. And anyone who is in the samurai knows that. And anyone who's truly on a spiritual yogic path should know it. You can check it out. If you try to fight, if Bruce Lee was standing here and he said, then the Taoist, he was he said, what is Taoism? What is Taoism? What is Zen? He'd say that to fight an enemy with an energy that approximates their own is already to be defeated. In the Bible it says, resist not evil. Right? Meaning don't fight evil with its own or anything that even comes close to aggression because you're just making it stronger. It, you, you've dug your own hole. In fact, your spider can get caught by its own web. It also says in the Bible, know thine enemy. And it would have been better for we if we had actually studied the enemy. Because our secret is in studying how they have controlled us is the way we need to act also to subvert it. But you don't fight fire with fire. What you do is, the, 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 the sort of the martial arts ultimate equation is this. When you are so constitutionally strong that your enemy cannot defeat you, then you have won. It's Aikido. Ask any Aikido master. When you cannot be moved because you are so psychologically, emotionally, and physically strong and your enemy can't defeat you, you've won. The cosmos sees that you've won. They're defeating us because they're working on lowering our immune system in every which way. That's why we're vulnerable and, 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 and are losing. Learn right meditation. I add that because, yeah, we're in the New Age. We've got 30 years of the so-called hippie New Age movement, and we're in a worse place we are now than when it started. That is because you can't learn meditation from any other person. Anyone who even tells you that they're going to teach you it is a liar and a fake. There's only one kind of meditation, your own. There's only one kind of soul, and that's your own. There is no collective mind, and there's no collective soul. There's only your soul, and it will speak to you in its own voice and its own way. It will also teach you the right meditation. And for you, it could be taking a walk. For another person, it's two and a half hours in the, in the yoga pose. For others, it's burning incense and candles. For another, it's listening to Beethoven. For others, it's ma making love. For others, it's planting a garden. There is no way that it's the same for everybody. When you hear John Ramborn playing the guitar, you're in heaven. When you hear Segovia, when you, when you see a Salvador Dollar painting, right? when you marvel at, at something like the, Char the you know, Chartres Cathedral, there are all forms of enlightenment. There's all forms of meditation. The Taoists even say that your attempt to meditate is wrong meditation. Cheng Su in the 300 years BC used to really upset all the Confucian, you know, the Confucians who are like the Christianity of, 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 of Japan and China, and Chung Su, the Taoist, would come along and go, your, a 
attempt to escape desire is still a desire. <laughs> and they go, out! <laughs> Don't ruin our little talk here, our Confucian, you know, we're going to escape desire. The answer is to get rid of desire. But isn't that also a desire? <laughs> oh, the bloody towers burn them. <laughs> See, the mind gets you into these loops. And as I said, most people cannot comprehend how any so-called secret society could just move in and take over, as it were. We fail to realize that all post-Diluvian empires were based on the Atlantean pattern and that the progeny of the warlocks of Atlantis have subjugated all peoples for thousands of years by autocratic and theocratic means. Moreover, uh, the main reasons for their success and domination of over every class beneath them in their engineered hierarchy lies in the fact that they have virtually no opposition whatsoever. That's the answer. Their so-called opposition has been in many instances of their own creation, you know, like cardboard opposites that they have made themselves in the dialectic. Well, and the resistance of a few distinguished individuals down through time, however valiant and commendable, has almost no lasting effect. Humankind's true opposition begins now. The reason why we're in this predicament is just what that says. They haven't had any opposition, so if the ball parks all yours, hey, then you win. Do you know that in 21st century, is the opposition, and you're it. They don't even know the, what's happening. They're in shock because they have never had any resistance. They're having it now for the first time through the Stephen Greers, through the Jordan Maxwells, through the David Ikes, through, you know, it doesn't matter. These are the first time that an ordinary man has questioned anything and is now on the attack, and they can't believe it. Here's a couple more solutions to meditate on. They're in the book, by the way, all of these. If I brought a chess master here and said, hey, mate, I want to learn how to learn chess. Can you give me a couple of pointers? He's likely to say these things. He's going, you need a sense of patience. If you don't have any patience, don't bother starting because that's what you're going to need to win. You're also going to need a sense of timing. You also have to have knowledge of your opponent, right, which implies psychological knowledge. That's very key. Number three is very key, psychological knowledge. And fourthly, you have to have the willingness to make any and all sacrifices. From this little tablet, you can now see why we've been losing. We have no patience whatsoever where the Nephilim, look what they've done even to get one part of their gig together. They can wait 11,000 years. They have infinite patience. Sense of timing, well, astrologically is what I think this really means. We got none. We're not even using our own divination to save our asses. We got the, we're on a boat going somewhere and we throw in the compass and the oars overboard. Divination is our compass to know where the hell at least we're heading. These guys, oh, they don't do a thing. Not an opening of this or a closing of that, an assassination here, a building of that, the very launching of the euro dollar, the marriages of, of famous personalities, the opening of banks, is everything is done on sidereal time. J.P. Morgan, the greatest financier in your country, said millionaires do not use astrology, the billionaires do. Right? <laughs> Knowledge of our opponent, oh, we're dead there. None, apart from not, finally in the research community, we're trying to find out what the hell's been going on. Knowledge of us, oh my God. They have studied us inside out, upside down, back to front. Our biology, our needs, our desires, our matrix, our libido, our sexuality. There ain't a thing that they don't have on their graphs about us. But they made us. They made us anyway. And their henchmen have been studying us inside out. Fill in, anybody, look at Scientology, which is a front for these groups. The document that you fill in, the so-called questionnaire for Scientology, alone shocks the hell out of me. The Mormons, is it not, keep records, don't they, of every single human being that's ever lived? Because these people are all fronts for these Masonic orders. And even if we were to get all of these done, we fail anyway, do we not? Because what is the last one? The willing to make any and all sacrifices. We having the what? The human conscience. Oh, can't do that. They, when and where. We have the moral component, which can sometimes be, unfortunately, a betrayal of ourselves because we're not willing to play the game. We don't know the rules of the game. Said in another way, probably even better, is Gulan Langtot. She wrote The Medical Mafia, and I like how she describes it. She says there's four ways to win in any war, and she uses the symbol of David and Goliath. You know, the little King David comes out with a sling and kills the Goliath. She said that David identified the enemy. He found a weakness. He used a simple weapon, and he was determined to win. 
Identifying the enemy is what we've been doing tonight, today, right? Finding the weakness is also what we're doing. Because if you know thine enemy and what they're about, you can find the weakness. Hey, there's a weakness. They're not spiritually in tune, right? They're going to lose. You know, we got uh, powers behind us. You, oh, there's certain ways to find the weakness in the dragon. Hmm? Sometimes. Yeah. And we can find a simple weapon. This is the one that most people don't really grasp. It's very simple because, as they say, a single match of light can, is, can light up a darkened room, but the same amount of darkness cannot extinguish a room of light. And you have to be determined to win. Four simple equations, and the job is done. You can elaborate on that and say collaboration, education, and sovereignty. Let me get to that um, actual part. There. For there, I'd said that they have an infernal trinity, right? <clears throat> problem, reaction, solution, or problem, confusion, solution, which they've used for millennia against us. Well, we can replace that with a supernal trinity. Collaboration or collab education. Sovereignty, which is very important, and I'm talking about legal sovereignty, including psych psychological sovereignty. And then freedom. The round table idea that when we all come together and put our bloody partisan you know, realities aside, when the arm is aching, you can't send the arm to the doctor. You've got the whole body to go, right? So in the body politic, some of us are arms, some of us are eyes, some of us are noses. We've got to all drop that all the stupid street-level differences. It's perfectly okay on a street level to be a Republican or a Democrat, or you know, a Republican or a conservative or a, or a Lutheran and a Methodist. That's all right. That works on the street level. Fine. Do it. But when you realize that there's a pestilence that's eating the whole of you know, the macro level of, of your reality, you've got to drop that for a minute and become people, become citizens, and fight the real enemy in the old round table way, which is the communion of all in a circle on the earth. Or you can use the legal system against the ones who've put it in place. A very important thing. The Chief Justice from about 25 years ago has got a website called Vote to Impeach. You just get on there as a citizen and you impeach these people out of office. For the crimes they've done, they should be impeached. And take a page out of your own history. The, president, the present representative democratic model is severely antiquated, dating back to the 1700s. 240 million people now represented by a mere 500 members of Congress. Now with the electronic media and the internet and direct communication, there's a need for a paradigm shift in this regard. You know the guy, that you, the representative that you sent to, the, the, to Congress was the guy that the village liked the least. You put him on a horseback and go, see ya, and you sent him off to represent you. We can't be doing it that way anymore. So I got a question for you in the end. In, the end, in, in this end. What percentage of the colonialists rose up against the legions of King George III during the American War of Independence? King George of England was the worst tyrant that anyone ever knew in those days. He was the most powerful monarch, and he had mercenaries from Germany and all over Europe to fight the colonists of this country to take away the rights. 10%. It was 3 to 6%. What was everybody else doing? That's what they're doing now, shivering under the bed in fear, waiting for it all to go away. So drop this idea that we all need to get together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's never going to be that way. It's going to be an educated, small maybe group of people, but who are dedicated, who are absolutely sure of their facts, who are behind the right people, you know, doing the right thing. And that is what's going to do it, because that's what's always done it. As he said, the United States of America can never be destroyed from forces outside its borders. If America falls, it will fall from within, brought down by apathy. When good people do nothing, anarchy reigns. And Martin Luther King said that our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about things that matter. So whether, whether you're using an you know, electric guitar, a microphone, a pen, a TV camera, you know, we don't fight with swords on the battlefields like my ancestors did. I've walked on those battlefields and I've seen it. Well, today we can't do that. So we fight with other tools, with other ways, with the internet, and other ways. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end. Thank you for <laughs> bearing with me. RVML Resource Center is a volunteer-operated federal 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit organization. 
RVML is dedicated to providing easy access to a comprehensive collection of information on a variety of metaphysical, spiritual, and personal development subjects. RVML accepts and appreciates all donations. Material and monetary contributions are fully tax deductible. This recording is not copyrighted and permission is granted to broadcast, exhibit, or duplicate all or part of this program for non-commercial educational purposes. This live presentation was organized and presented by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. For more information, please visit rvml.org.